morning. It is good to see you here with us, whether you're joining us online or in person. We're glad to have you worshiping with us. I have one announcement. Be sure to read all the announcements in your bulletin, but I have one in particular to emphasize to you, and that is we're going to resume our Wednesday night suppers this Wednesday. We're going to have box suppers and distant seating in the gym. We're going to be kicking off with hamburgers and hot dogs that are being cooked on site. So we'd love for you to be part of that. You can sign up online or you can call the church office. Uh, we're looking forward to this time together and resuming Wednesday night ministries in full. Again, let me encourage you to read all the announcements in your bulletin. And pay careful attention to them. We are happy to have you worshiping with us. So let us begin with this. Beloved congregation of Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Let us worship God.
call your attention to our responsive reading. It comes to us from Isaiah chapter 53. This is an Old Testament prophecy about Christ and Old Testament prophecy about the cross. Let us read God's word responsibly. Hear now the word of God. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let us stand and sing, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. pray. Almighty triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you this morning in the name of our wonderful, merciful Savior. Lord, we come to focus upon the cross, and we come to worship and praise the one who lived and died for us. Lord, we pray 
that you would pour out your spirit upon this congregation so that we may worship you in spirit and truth and that we may praise you for your great deeds. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing. Our opening hymn of praise is Praise Him, Praise Him. you'll find the words to the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. Let us answer this question this morning. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come to our uh, Heidelberg Catechism, our catechesis section. We sang just a minute ago about the offices of Jesus, prophet and priest and king, the Old Testament offices which he fulfilled. That is what question 31 is about. You'll find those same, uh, those same words in, in this answer. And so I'll ask the questions and we'll respond together with the answers. Question 31, why is he called Christ, that is, anointed? Because he is ordained of God the Father and anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of God 
concerning our redemption, and our only high priest, who by the one sacrifice of his body has redeemed us and ever lives to make intercession for us with the Father, and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and defends and preserves us in the redemption obtained for us. Then question 32, but why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and thus a partaker of his anointing, in order that I also may confess his name, may present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him, and with a free conscience may fight against sin and the devil in this life, and hereafter in eternity reign with him over all creatures. All right, let us look to our God in prayer. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is our prophet, our priest, our high priest, and our eternal king, we come to you this morning because we belong to Jesus. We are members of Christ. We are in Christ, and we are called by your name, Lord Jesus. And so we pray this morning with thankful hearts and gratefulness that you have acted on our behalf. We know that the scriptures have told us that you were despised, that mankind rejected you, that you suffered, that you knew all about pain, that you were despised by people, that you, uh, you were a person that people didn't think much about, you were held in low esteem. But the truth is that you took up our pain. You, in our place, suffered for us. And uh, you were considered punished by God, that you were considered to be afflicted by God. But really, you were, you were taking our spot. You were pierced for our transgressions. The scriptures tell us you were punished to bring us peace. Your wounds are what brings healing to us. And and even though we were sinners and had, uh, as the scriptures say, turned to our own way, God the Father laid on you our, all of our sin, all of our iniquity. And for this, we are forever grateful. We think of it as we have sung this morning that uh, when we see our, name, our names written in your wounds, that you suffered for us and we are free, we rejoice in that. We rejoice that death is crushed to death, that... You give us a life to live uh, that you won it, that won, won that life for us through your selfless love. And we can say, what a love. We stand forgiven at the cross. And who could have done that? Who could have done that except for the Lamb of God meant to take away the sins of men to rescue our souls? Oh, what a great and glorious thing we find that to be. And as we will... The hymn writer has written, and we will sing shortly, In our place, you stood condemned, and you bought us back with your own blood. And there can be no other response to that other than, Hallelujah, what a Savior. And so we come with praise in our hearts and gratitude. We pray that you will help us to live out our faith and our gratitude in the way we act and live day by day. And we make this prayer and all our prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation this morning is Man of Sorrows, What a Name. Hallelujah, what a Savior. We invite you to stand as you're able. Stand and sing, Man of Sorrows. Thank you. Thank you. 
Turn with me now in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. We're going to begin our reading at verse 13 and read through verse 25 of Luke chapter 23. Let us give our careful and attentive listening to the reading and hearing of God's Word. Hear now the Word of God, verse 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of the charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried together, Away with this man, that is Jesus, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city, and a murderer. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! The third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that Jesus should be crucified. And look at this next phrase. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man that had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Keep your Bibles open. This is God's Word. Let us pray. Lord, we see fallen nature in the raw here. But what we also see is grace. Lord, we pray that as we look at at, at this drama that surrounds the cross, that precedes the cross, that we would look into this drama, that we would identify with this drama. And this would change the way that we look at ourselves. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Spring of 2013, a television show on, of all things, the History Channel became a certified, bona fide ratings hit number one with a bullet. The show is a mini-series with a simple title. The title was The Bible. And part of the appeal of this mini-series was that it told a big story full of drama, and as we know, drama has a way of capturing and keeping our attention whether it be middle school girl drama, reality TV drama, or political drama. Let's face it, for us, drama is catnip. It's flypaper. It catches us. Now, as we look into this big drama before us this morning, here is a story with a cast of characters. And what I want you to do is this. Locate yourself in this drama. Because, listen, you're here. And so am I. So we're going to ask three diagnostic questions to find ourselves in this drama. And the first question is this. Do I see myself in Pontius Pilate? Do I see myself in Pontius Pilate? Now, as the drama unfolds, you heard just a moment ago, Pilate believes Jesus is innocent. He says so like three or four times. He knows that Jesus is not guilty. Pilate has the authority, he has the power to protect the innocent, and yet Pilate sends innocent Jesus to his death. Why? Because Pilate doesn't want the mob of Jewish movers and shakers to get angry. To put it in modern day terms, 
Pilate doesn't want to be canceled. The detail missing in Dr. Luke's account is Pilate washing his hands of the whole business. He's saying, I'm, I'm not responsible for this. But just because Pilate claims he's not responsible for a decision doesn't mean that Pilate is innocent. As a matter of fact, as we get down to verse 25, there's only one innocent person in this drama, and he is being sent off to the Roman equivalent of the electric chair, the cross. Now, as we consider this prefect, that's what a judge is, the Roman province of Judea, why don't we just condemn Pilate? I mean, right? Surely we would never do anything like that, would we? Friends, before we dismount from our high horse and celebrate our self-righteousness, we need to ask a very important question. The question is this, why did Pilate do what he did? And here's why. Listen to the voice of those who are crying out for Jesus being crucified. There's a decision here. Am I going to do the right thing, or am I going to cave to public pressure? Biblically, am I going to fear God or mankind? See, what we have in Pilate is someone who is convinced but compromised. He's convinced about who Jesus is. He's convinced that Jesus is not guilty, but he's compromised. Friends, take a moment, ask yourself this question. Have I ever done something I knew was wrong because I wanted to please somebody? Or have I ever done something that was wrong because I didn't want to displease somebody? somebody? Have I ever compromised my convictions? Have I ever kept silent when I should have spoken out because I didn't want to upset or offend somebody? If you answer that question no, then there's one of two options here for you. You're either perfect or you're in denial about how easily you cave to pressure. How many times do we do what we do to please other people, even if our pleasing other people is displeasing to the Lord? See, the question is this. In any situation, any decision you make, the question is this. Who is your Lord? The answer is this. The Lord is the one whose voice you listen to and obey. That's your Lord. Regardless of your confession, that's your Lord. And the root of Pilate's problem is that Pilate is a people pleaser who holds his finger up to the winds of public opinion. And since Pilate is what he is, Pilate makes the wrong decision. Now come on. We've been there, we've done that. Man, I want to pick on us for just a moment. Why are we so passive in our homes? I mean, we're supposed to be exercising loving Christian leadership. We're supposed to set the agenda. We're supposed to provide moral, spiritual direction. But we are afraid we're going to upset our families. And what happens? The whiners win. We cave. Call it what you will, but don't call it spiritual leadership. Back in the 1980s, author by the name of Dennis Waitley wrote a book entitled Seeds of Greatness, and there's a chapter on parenting where he talks about a young man named Ivan the Terrible. He's visiting the home of this man, their three-year-old son, Ivan. And he says, and I quote, Ivan was awful. And he was in total control of his parents. He would interrupt, he would make demands, he would talk to his parents like a marine drill sergeant. He would scream, and if his orders were not obeyed, he would get highly upset, almost flammable. At one point, the mother, in an effort to encourage Ivan to go into his playroom, which Waitley said was by far the biggest room in the house, in an effort to get him into his playroom, 
laid out a path of chocolate chip cookies for him to follow into the playroom. Ivan only stayed there about a minute, and he returned back, being the little spoon that he was, stirring it up. And so, after a, what Waitley said was an insufferable visit because of this young man, he stood up to leave, and Ivan began to run at him full speed. He was going to headbutt Waitley below the waist. Well, he dodged Ivan. Ivan fell to the ground. He started crying. And here's what the parents said. There, there, Ivan. Mr. Waitley didn't mean to hurt you. Well, Dennis, aren't you going to apologize to little Ivan? Haley said he, he paused for what seemed to him to be an hour, but it's probably just a few seconds. Collected his thoughts, and this is what he said. You know, maybe I should apologize because, after all, it is poor manners to upset the head of the house. You see, here's a case of professing Christian parents preferring keeping the peace to raising their child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's other tragic cases of cowardly leadership. It's happening right now in churches all across the world where the leadership is caving to the demands of certain special interest groups. People who want the church to endorse and marry couples whose unions are out of accord with the basic biblical standard of one man, one woman, united in a monogamous marriage. The pressure is great. But sometimes in conservative churches, pastors and leaders won't say or do anything that, that makes any, them unpopular with any people group in the church. We need to remember, truth is never popular. When you speak up for what's right, when you speak out against what's wrong, rest assured, speak the truth, somebody is going to get angry. Somebody. But the threat of anger from people groups provides no good reason whatsoever for caving to what's wrong. Now, remember, God wants us to be respectful. He wants us to listen to others who do not have the same views we do. He wants us to, he wants us to make sure these people are heard. We're supposed to speak with speech that is seasoned with tact and grace. But there is no excuse for being an arrogant jerk. There is no excuse because the gospel plants seeds of humility in us and not pride. But listen, if you're going to be in any place of leadership, and all of you are someplace in leadership, every day you need to ask, am I leading out of fear of other people? I know no one wants to be seen as odd or strange or weird. No one likes to be labeled an extremist or out of the mainstream, whatever the mainstream is. It changes day to day. Nevertheless, the Lord we love and worship calls on us to have a wholehearted commitment to Him regardless of what other people think. And I have a true confession to make, and that's this. The only difference between Pilate and me is a difference in degree. That's it. That's the only difference between Pilate and me. It's a difference in degree. Pilate was facing an angry mob, possible exile, possible execution by the emperor of Rome. But me... I cave to the, to the thought of mild disapproval from people, people I may or may not even like. I ask you, do you share my allergy to the poison ivy of disapproval? Well, how do you solve this problem with fear of men? Here's how. Very simple. Believe the gospel. You see, when you believe the gospel, you begin to wrap your head around the magnitude of what God has done for us in Christ. 
You do that, and then you'll find the Lord will be the primary object of your love, the primary object of your affection. And because you love the Lord so much for what He did for you, then you'll want to please the one you love the most. What I really care about at that time are not all these sets of eyes looking disapprovingly at me, but one set of eyes that I want to look approved by. Friends, please hear this. The death of Christ on the cross secures our total acceptance and approval by the only person who ultimately matters, and that is the Lord God. So why are you concerned about what other people think about you? Perhaps you're making it all about you. You see, when you get to the point where you no longer need people's thumbs up, attaboys, girls, and Facebook likes, you're no longer enslaved by that, then you're free. You're free to love other people by doing what God says is the right thing to do. You're free to love others by doing what's best for the ones you love. So I ask you, do you find yourself in Pilate, the people pleaser? There's another question that we ask. This focuses on another character. And the second question is this. Do I see myself in the crowd? Do I see myself in Pilate? Do I see myself in the crowd? Look at verse 18. But they all cried out together. They are the Jewish and Roman high rollers and everybody else. People from every walk of life, every social class, they're crying out in a shared chorus, crucify him. Now think about this. Just five days ago, Jesus rides into Jerusalem. These crowds cheered and blessed Jesus. Public approval rating of 95%. Now some of these same people are calling out for Jesus' blood. Let this be a warning to you. So much for the moral imperative of public opinion polls. Why do you even read them? Friends, from a biblical perspective, not every majority is a moral majority. The attitude, the actions of the crowd make us aware of a couple of dynamics. One is this. There's this dynamic of a mob mentality. It may be an actual mob. It may be a social media mob. Uh, people doing things in a mob they would not normally do if they actually sat down and sorted out what they're doing. Look, I understand it's easy to go with the flow. It is very difficult to swim upstream from the flow. But there's a deeper dynamic going on here with the crowd. This mob mentality we see here in, in this narrative displays Psalm 2 acted out on the stage of human history. In this story, in the howling hatred of the mob, we see how people really are apart from God's grace. You see, unless God's grace intervenes, please hear this when you read the headlines when you go home. Unless God's grace intervenes, Fallen people living in a fallen world will, will prefer a violent criminal over Jesus, the Prince of Peace. That's what's happening here. You see, the biblical principle is this. No one is neutral toward Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, Whoever is not for me is against me. Do you hear any neutrality on that? You can't straddle the fence. There is no DMZ. You can't stand in the middle of the road or you'll get hit by traffic going both ways. You see, every day in every decision, every choice we make, we are choosing to either be on Team Jesus or we're siding with the mob. Here's the question. Who am I with? So remember this. In a fallen world full of fallen people, Jesus is a threat. He's a threat because Jesus stands between me and my desire to be king of my life. 
to be queen of my life, to run my world the way I want to, to make lifestyle choices with the soundtrack of Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way playing behind me. It's a choice to join in this chorus of people who are saying, away with this man, Jesus, give us Barabbas. Now you know what the real tragedy is here? It's that every person in this room, including myself, when it comes to following the crowd, we all have blood on our hands. But the wonder of it all is that Jesus shed His blood on the cross to secure for Himself a people out of this fallen mass of self-exalting, sin-infected humanity. And you know, one day, by God's grace alone, we're going to join in the chorus of another crowd of people singing with a loud voice. The, the word in Revelation 5 is singing megaphonically in heaven. Worthy, that is of highest praise, is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and dominion forever and ever. You see, in my fallen state, I find myself in the crowd. But because of God's grace alone, I hope to be part of another crowd of people in heaven. People who will give all the glory to God. So you ask yourself this morning, really, which crowd do I want to be part of? That leads us to the third question. There's Pilate, the people pleaser. There's the crowd. It's like mice following the Pied Piper over a cliff. Third question is this. Do I see myself in Barabbas? Do I see myself in Barabbas? You look at verses 18, 19, and verse 25, and you piece together information from the four Gospels. Now, here's the skinny on Barabbas. He's in jail. He's guilty of starting a riot. He is a murderer. It's plural. He's a dangerous criminal, an insurrectionist, a killer. Barabbas is, in other words, the polar opposite of how we see ourselves this morning. But just for a moment, if you would, in your imagination, put yourself in Barabbas' sandals. Think about this. You're incarcerated in a Roman slammer, on death row, awaiting execution. It's a just execution for your crimes. Day after day after day, you sit in dreadful anticipation of the worst form of death you can imagine. You think of the nails. You think of the excruciating pain. You think of dying by suffocation with blood filling your lungs. You anticipate how it's going to feel when somebody breaks your legs. Then, the dreaded day arrives. You can hear the crowds. They're saying, crucify Him. You're thinking, Him is me. The Roman guards drag you out in front of an angry mob. And then, they look at you and they say, Barabbas, you're good to go. You're free. You stand there, stunned. You watch another man stumble under the weight of the cross. A cross you picture yourself carrying. You go into the crowd, you say, who is this man? You hear different opinions, but there's one thing you know. And that's this. You are going to live as a free man. Because that man is going to receive the condemnation, the punishment, and the death that you deserved for the crimes you committed. In other words, Jesus will die in your place for your crimes. Friends, please understand, if you profess Christ today, when you see Barabbas, 
I hope and pray you are looking into a mirror. Because we are sinners, incarcerated in the prison of God's wrath, awaiting the day when we will receive the punishment we deserve. But Jesus goes to the cross in our place. Ralph Davis calls this the Barabbas theory of atonement. Because Jesus gets what we deserve, we get what Jesus deserved. Friends, this is the glory of the cross. God the Father sent God the Son to die for people like Barab us. Us. Jesus died for sinners so that sinners like us would be rescued from the punishment we deserve. Here's the distinction. Justice is getting what you deserve. As R.C. Sproul used to say, don't ever ask God for justice for you because he might give it. Justice is getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you do not deserve. What we're asking for is grace. So let me ask you a question. Who are you in this story? I'm not going to speak for you. I'll speak for myself. I'm Pilate. By nature, I have a yellow streak a mile wide. I have a personal history of caving in to the will of other people, even if it means compromising God's will. And I am in this crowd going with the flow, even when the flow is going against the Lord, choosing to do life my way, not His way. But, and I'm asking this of you, are you praising God this morning that you are Barabbas? Because you see, in this drama, Barabbas is not the hero. But Barabbas is a free man because of what Jesus did for him. Beloved, there is only one hero in this story. And that hero is Jesus. So let me leave you with the question. Is Jesus the hero of your story? I pray to God He is. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at this, at this drama, we're there. We're people who, who cave in to the will of other people. We compromise. We're there in the crowd. We go with the flow. It doesn't matter if the flow is going against you or for you. We're, we're going with the flow. But Lord, I pray for each person in this congregation, including myself, I, I pray that we see ourselves in Barabbas, Barabbas. Because he's free because Jesus took his place. Lord, help us to understand that in our personal stories, in the drama of our life, there is only one hero, and that hero is Jesus. We pray that we'll be able to leave this place this morning and confess Jesus is the hero in my story. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us conclude this morning as we sing. It's printed in the bulletin, the second verse of Praise Him, Praise Him. Let us stand and sing together.
remind you, if you would, please, to leave through these two doors as you exit this morning. Beloved congregation of Jesus Christ, receive the benediction. Now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.